Um, hi, everybody. My name is Dario. I'm the um, science program officer at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And I had a fantastic introduction just with a keynote this morning talking about uh, challenges around sustainability of open infrastructure. And that's going to be exactly the topic of my talk today. Um, I'm going to start by saying that open source infrastructure is invisible. Um, where it is maintained by volunteers, academics, nonprofits, companies, um, the open source software underpins pretty much every aspect of our daily lives. Uh, is something that we very often take for granted as a, a commodity, right? Something that is going to be always there, that we can always rely upon. Uh, and the labor itself that goes into creating and maintaining uh, all of this work, especially when it's volunteer driven, uh, is equally invisible. Um, how many of you know about uh, um, this beautiful report, Roads and Bridges? Yeah, it's a highly recommended read um, written by Nadia Egbal in 2016 for the Ford Foundation. It really lays out all the challenges and all the issues around uh, um, supporting the unseen labor behind digital infrastructure. So at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, when we started working with the scientific communities that we support, we immediately realized that the very same challenges apply to um, the open source software that um, hundreds and thousands of uh, scientists rely upon on a regular basis. So open source software that is, uh, has become critical to modern science, um, specifically modern uh, biomedical research that uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative supports, um, very often lacks dedicated funding for maintenance, for growth, for development, for community engagement. Um, ironically, funding often becomes um, an issue when these projects reach maturity. So very often can be funded at very early stages, maybe as a byproduct of some research grant, but when they become critical, when they become really mature and adopted by a vast number of projects and researchers, that's where they suffer the most uh, for, for funding, um, sustainable funding. That was the motivation behind uh, uh, the program that we launched uh, earlier this year. And um, I'm gonna share with you some of the, uh, uh, the learnings uh, um, we, uh, we found by launching the first round of this of this program this year. So what we're aiming to find uh, to fund with this project uh, is uh, uh, a very specific set of uh, open source tools. Uh, we're not uh, looking to fund the entire open source ecosystem. And in particular, we're looking at those open source projects that have demonstrated impact uh, in the scientific communities that um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative primarily supports. So primarily the uh, life sciences um, and biomedicine at large. Um, this means that research code that individual labs develop and it is basically produced and shared by a handful of researchers is out of scope for this program. And what is equally out of scope is generic open source software such as the Linux kernel that supports like a, many more people but is not really critical to uh, biomedical research. And more specifically, um, we're aiming to fund a, a blend uh, of domain-specific tools. Think about like libraries and software packages that are really specific to individual domains of the life sciences, as well as foundational software. So software that supports a variety of workflows for data analysis, visualization, um, uh, modeling, uh, that are not specific to uh, biomedicine, but they're eligible as long as they've demonstrated the impact in the field. What does the program look like? Uh, we're planning to fund uh, projects uh, uh, for an amount between 50K and 250K um, dollars. Um, the grant duration is one year. Um, and applications can be submitted at any of three cycles. So we just closed the first cycle. I'm gonna share today something we've learned during the first cycle, but the next two cycles are gonna coming up. The next uh, uh, call is gonna open in December um, this year. And one of the key features of this program is that we try to be as agnostic as possible about uh, what constitutes uh, fundable work. So we really want to recognize that many of these projects suffer from a variety of pain points when it comes to maintenance, um, uh, whether it's like community engagement, what is like documentation, what is like uh, um, improving the usability of software. Um, we want to hear from these projects what they are suffering from. We don't want to be prescriptive about uh, what should be funded to address their uh, maintenance gaps. And uh, last but not least, we also encouraged 
projects to uh, get together and submit um, applications for joint work to try and encourage uh, interoperability and better integration between these projects. So um, what did we get in response to the first, uh, um, the first call? Uh, we received in total um, just, uh, just about 300 applications, like just short of uh, 300 applications. Uh, in total, that represents uh, nearly 500 uh, individual open source projects. Uh, again, as a reminder, um, each application can include up to five um, open source projects. Um, a few things at a high level that we learn. The vast majority, I was surprised to see that the vast majority of these projects, uh, including some that are really going back decades, there are some very well-established projects, uh, um, are now hosted on GitHub. Um, GitHub represented 90% um, of the uh, um, uh, of the applications that we received. Um, we saw a strong representation of the languages, the programming languages that we were expecting. Uh, if you saw Arfan's presentation yesterday, the distribution of languages um, matches very closely what he was presenting as the most popular libraries uh, in, uh, in JAWS. Um, the majority of these applications came from academic organization, but it was also a fairly sizable number of applications coming from nonprofits uh, and even from industry. And uh, of these 300 applications, uh, we had a pretty broad representation of uh, fields across uh, the disciplines that CCI supports. And that included also a pretty significant share of foundational tools that again are not specific to biomedicine per se. Uh, so fields such as uh, neuroscience, imaging, genomics, um, single cell biology, uh, et cetera, were all uh, pretty well represented in the, in the application pool. So what have we learned so far? Um, the first learning was uh, actually something that we saw very early on. We uh, first announced uh, the, uh, the program the community reaction was pretty strong, uh, indicating that uh, there is clearly a critical gap in the current funding model around uh, the uh, sustainability of the Open Source Foundation for Science. And um, I think what was most uh, insightful was to see uh, specific uh, um, maintainers of scientific open source software calling out the fact that funders very often have a bias in support of shiny new things. Um, which results almost by definition in the creation of a brilliant but often non-sustainable projects. Um, question becomes, how can we start like rebalancing the investment into risky and important new things uh, with the need, the very much, uh, um, the, the very critical need of supporting uh, the existing tools for their uh, ongoing maintenance. There's a, also a great interview uh, that NumFocus um, published a few days ago with Anne Carpenter that really uh, covers the, 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 the motivation uh, and the, the inspiration for this program. So I really encourage you to take a look at that. What did we ask reviewers to take into account? Um, we asked reviewers to assess the proposals against three criteria. So the first one is impact. Uh, we asked them to assess the uh, existing impact of these open source projects that would respect to the communities that they serve. We asked them to assess the quality of the open source project from a, a best practice and engineering perspective. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that and speak more about what we mean by that. And of course, we asked them to also assess the feasibility of the plan of work, um, submitting a budget, figuring out if given the existing resources, the budget that we're asking, um, the plan of work uh, was reasonable and, and well described. We also asked the applicants to um, uh, include uh, an optional diversity statement uh, to describe any measures that the project would implement uh, to secure the diversity and inclusion in their contributor base. And these are some of the few things that we learned. The first thing that I saw that I f frankly knew about anecdotally, but I found shocking, um, is the fact that even the most established projects uh, in scientific open source uh, are really struggling for funding. Um, this, is this makes absolutely no sense if you think about it. Um, an, e an interesting comparison point is the fact that the single most cited paper in the history of science was cited about 300,000 times, right? So that's basically, by some measure, you can consider that like the, uh, the most impactful piece of research in science. Some of these projects have dependencies in the same order of magnitude. So we're talking about uh, open source projects that have uh, dependencies um, above uh, 100,000 um, packages. We have projects that are um, 
that are downloaded and used like uh, uh, tens of millions of times per week. Um, and if you look at their current um, maintenance model, very often there's no dedicated funding for maintenance. And at best, there are a few hours uh, per week that the employers uh, agree, given that this is so important and impactful, uh, they agree the maintainers to spend into, uh, into supporting this software. So huge asymmetry between what we value in science and the impact that this project have. Um, when it comes to the quality, uh, we took a, a closer look and we actually asked the, the, the reviewers to uh, uh, take a comprehensive view um, at the, uh, the features of these projects from a, an open source best practice perspective. And we collected pretty um, detailed um, metrics about uh, whether this project had a, a code of conduct, documentation, um, issue tracking, uh, if they were like engaging with the community in soliciting and resolving pull requests. Um, if they have contribution guidelines and easy examples for uh, for users uh, and, and contributors, and if they had like uh, package distribution um, systems uh, and continuous integration, and the more we narrow down the pool through different stages of the uh, uh, of the evaluation process, the more we saw that these practices, as expected, uh, were were uh, bubbling up and becoming more and more common. Um, when it comes to the feasibility, about uh, half of the uh, applications requested a maximum funding. That again suggests that really there's a, there's a strong need for, for funding uh, in, um, in this area. Um, and we don't fool ourselves into thinking that uh, a 12-month grant is a solution to the sustainability of this project. So, um, um, but we think it's a way of stabilizing, stabilizing uh, the, these projects uh, and potentially showing a possible model for other funders or for uh, other sources of, uh, um, of support uh, to contribute to supporting these projects. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And finally, when it comes to diversity, and unsurprisingly, uh, this is a really uh, white male dominated field. I'm not saying anything surprising here. Uh, open source suffers from very well known uh, gender uh, and demographic biases. Uh, this becomes even more strongly evident when you're focusing on the more established projects that have been around for a long time. Um, we, would like, we would like to encourage and support uh, more diversity, uh, both through the um, direct applications, but also through the measures that this project implement to support their contributor base. Um, one interesting thing is that this diversity statement that was optional was actually um, submitted by 60% of the applications. And that number goes up to 70% when the project is led by a woman. Um, and finally, we were um, delighted to see that um, about half of the, um, of the applications included a, a code of conduct. And we'll be working with the uh, successful grantees to make sure that if it didn't have a code of conduct, uh, they implement one uh, by the time uh, the, uh, the grant is executed. Uh, possibly the most exciting thing for me as a researcher, I mean, of course, it's super important we're fund funding these projects, but uh, there's also a ton of data that we've been collecting uh, through the process. Um, this is basically one of the rare opportunities where we're looking at 500 projects that are really critical to science, uh, telling us about uh, their pain points, uh, their um, uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, so we have a massive corpus of qualitative data that we think represents an enormous opportunity for the community to learn uh, about what's possible and what's needed. Um, so uh, we're going to start a research project to crunch uh, um, what is currently around like 2,000 pages or 1 million words uh, of self-reported uh, description of these projects beyond uh, the actual metrics uh, that describe these, these open source um, um, software packages to try and really understand uh, uh, what, what this these projects, what these maintainers suffer from uh, in their uh, daily maintenance needs. So um, we will be announcing the first uh, cohort um, in uh, a couple of weeks. So the notifications like literally went out uh, um, this week, so a couple of days ago, they're not public yet. Um, but I wanted to share a few words about uh, what um, we're planning to do next and what I think lies ahead uh, for the program as a whole. Uh, first off, the question of what counts as success. Um, as I said before, I don't think that this is going to be, by any measures, the, the, the solution to the problem of sustainability. Um, 
what we'll be able to fund with the current uh, um, budget and resources is a fraction of all the projects that would deserve uh, to be supported. Um, but we're hoping that this can be uh, a model that governmental agencies can then pick up. Uh, so like a demonstrate uh, a possible way of identifying uh, types of work that up until now were invisible and uh, not valued and as a result uh, not directly um, fundable as a dedicated um, targets. And um, of course, the initiatives such as the uh, soft sustainability uh, initiative are really uh, thought a lot about the problem and are really laying the foundation for how we should think about uh, uh, this problem, uh, not just from a funding perspective, but also from a governance perspective. Um, and again, this is not something that CCI can do can do alone. And we're looking at um, potentially creating coalitions of funders uh, that can support uh, the same idea of um, addressing maintenance gaps across a variety of disciplines, even beyond the, the biomedical sciences. Um, and there are also, of course, uh, interesting models that are emerging. Um, I don't know if you've uh, heard of uh, Tidelift and some of these projects basically to uh, get companies and, and for-profits and whoever reuses a specific uh, software package to contribute back to the uh, um, to the maintainers by tracking the dependencies of the uh, of the software they use um, and I think we we're talking before about uh, you know how strapped for resources institutions are specifically libraries and I think there's an opportunity to rethink as we look at the entire life cycle of research uh, at a question of how much we spend to support publishing, specifically traditional publishing, as opposed to supporting this infrastructure, without saying that libraries should allocate more funding because they're really working on very limited budget, um, can we think of like maybe rebalancing the money that goes into traditional publishing and moving more towards supporting infrastructure? Um, the other critical piece that um, we've learned is still missing is a question of uh, uh, credit and attribution. Um, this place force has been really uh, catalytic, catalytic getting uh, issues of uh, well, proposals around uh, software citation uh, of the ground. Um, so this is really the place where the discussion is, uh, is happening and there are great evolving recommendation around uh, software citation practices. Um, and I know there are also like uh, fantastic projects that are trying to extract from literature software mentions and try and get a better understanding of uh, you know what this graph looks like uh, that represents the relation between papers or preprints uh, and uh, software packages. Um, however, this data is really sparse and there are many, many gaps that we currently have uh, in um, representing these relations. Um, one idea that I'm really excited about is the idea that uh, Dan Katz brought up of like uh, getting funders to uh, solicit uh, information uh, on software used by their grantees. That sounds like a fantastic and pretty straightforward thing to implement. And, and more generally, I also think that um, what we still don't know today is um, what what software libraries are used uh, whenever scientists and researchers produce the results. So right now, we may be able to extract from the literature um, informal software mentions um, from you know the text uh, of, of a paper, but it's really hard to understand uh, if you know um, a specific productivity tool or a specific visualization library was used in order to produce a paper, unless the authors assert or somehow specify as part of the metadata of that paper that that software was used uh, for for the study. So I think there's a critical gap there to create a registry of software used by a given study irrespective of whether it's uh, an actual dependency of a piece of code uploaded to a repository. So these are some of the big challenges ahead. Uh, I don't have uh, any answer <laughs> to how to address them, but I'm hoping to hear from you uh, about how we can uh, work together towards this. And um, as a reminder, um, this was the first cycle um, of our program. There are two more cycles coming up. The next one uh, is gonna be in December. And so uh, I look forward to seeing more and more applications uh, from the community. Thank you. Questions? Right there. Um, thank you. Got it. Adam Hyde from Coco. Um, thank you for that. It was really, really interesting. I'm just um, interested in how you approach or if you have any thoughts about 
working with um, the culture of um, projects where um, there's a fine line between a, a funder sort of playing a sort of a godlike um, uh, role and sort of driving um, a organisation that needs funding towards a certain direction, and then another one where you know working with them to sort of develop a, a, a uh, some pr key principles or bring out some key principles and just wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, whether you see that as an issue or, or, or how to approach it. Yeah, so um, I, I think sustainability is much more than just funding as I kind of hinted um, before and um, one of the things that, we're, that CZI is doing with uh, grantees across programs um, is to convene grantees so um, we have uh, basically budget to bring together all grantees and put them all in a room and ask them, okay, what are types of like a, um, services, types of support that you need, um, um, opportunities that are shared maybe across fields, especially when you have like um, people in projects like serving different fields that don't necessarily have an opportunity to talk to each other because they go to different conferences. So we'll be doing this and we're hoping actually to uh, learn beyond funding what types of, uh, again, support these projects need that may not be visible just when you ask for um, an application for funding. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you manage the reviewing process? Because it seems to me there's a big diversity of projects that you're trying to assess. And in a normal reviewing process, you know, it's all within a certain pool of expertise. So I'm just interested in hearing a bit, a bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the review process was actually fairly um, intense uh, and a uh, large uh, scale operation. Uh, we had a total of um, between the internal and external reviewers. We had like a staff at CCI as well as external experts. Uh, I want to say around uh, uh, 90 people, including advisors. Um, the way we chose um, the allocation of, uh, um, of uh, experts was really based on, uh, if you think about the, uh, the selection criteria that I mentioned before, uh, there's a question about the demonstrated impact uh, of uh, these tools with respect to their own communities. And so we really wanted to have uh, experts from the respective scientific communities to tell us, okay, this is the actual tool that, um, uh, single cell biology uh, scientists are using the field, um, but also complement that with um, experts coming from um, open source best practices. So we had a blend of, uh, uh, of expertise coming from both fields uh, to try and assess uh, the applications against these multiple criteria. Hi, uh, following up from the uh, extensive reviewing that you did, will you actually be returning this to the applicants? Because I hear there's some frustration in the community that they did lots of these beautiful proposals. You've now got all this wonderful data, but they didn't get any responses to the, the they didn't get any feedback for their own reviews. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's been like quite some discussion on social just the last 24 hours. Buzz on the yes. social media. Yes. So. Um, we will not be able to provide individual um, feedback or guidance. I also want to make sure that we have a, we provide like a, a fair chance to other projects that w were not applying the first cycle um, to apply for future cycles um, without like supporting specific applicants with dedicated information other than what we state publicly about the goals of the project. That being said, uh, um, we'll be publishing in the coming weeks um, a lot more um, of what we've learned um, so in aggregate about the project, and I'm really committed to making sure that uh, uh, anything we learn internally um, can be fed back to the community also to provide more support, more guidance to some projects may think they are in scope and in fact, uh, they ended up becoming sort of the margin of what we're supporting. So um, I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing in the coming months uh, more and more in writing about the program. Yeah, I think there was one more question. Hi, thanks for the nice informative talk. Uh, what's the catch? I mean, what are you getting from this? Uh, why should people apply apart from getting some money without having, well, what's your what's your profit in that? I know it's a no profit foundation, but it's still a Zuckerberg foundation. So I personally don't trust it, but, but 
Yeah, I respect that. It, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, is a philanthropic endeavor. Um, it's we 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 don't um, intend to make money out of uh, of this project. There's no collection of uh, private data or some um, evil goals that we support uh, secretly through this program. Um, I respect that some people may not be um, may not consider like this program or, or the organization a good fit for what they're doing. Which I totally respect. Um, there are other funders that are funding similar initiatives. Um, those who want to work with us, uh, we would like to solicit uh, uh, application from them. There's no, yeah, there's no cat. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah. We're out of time, but we've got one more. <laughs> sure. Right, quick question. Um, so it's great that you've got all this data. Um, that would be useful for other people too. Can you make this actually everything open, the, the application, as long as the, the applicant is, is happy about it, and the reviews, for example? That would be great data to share if they agree. Yeah, so um, I cannot make everything open. Uh, and there's also like some sensitive information that uh, applicants are submitting that is not meant to be, to be made open. Um, what I'm going to do is to make as much as I can publicly available because, again, um, um, this is a, an effort to support communities. Um, we have, uh, we're not trying to um, understand something that we want to uh, capitalize on internally. This is really something that's meant for the community to learn more about, uh, about these opportunities. So um, uh, we will be sharing, um, I think we'll be encouraging um, our successful grantees to share uh, their applications publicly. Um, some of the applicants already posted their application um, before submitting, which I think is great. It's something we, we support and we encourage. Um, and yeah, we'll be looking at sharing as much as we can without uh, compromising the uh, confidentiality or privacy of individual applicants. Right, we have coffee now, um, but we'll just say thank you to Dario again. <laughs>